Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I am Kim England. I am the director of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies at the University of Washington. The Harry Bridges Center was established in 1992, a grassroots, a grassroots fundraising effort by the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, the ILWU, uh, uh, members and pensioners gathered a thousand bucks from a, each of a thousand people to establish an endowed faculty chair in labor studies in honor of longtime ILW president, the very great Harry Bridges. 2020 has been a year of note for the Bridges Center because it actually marks 30 years since Harry died. In 2010, following another grassroots labor archives is a community archive because the labor community play a pivotal role. It is a means of investing in and retaining the history of working people. I am excited to be involved in, the, in its 10th anniversary celebrations. Now, I wish to thank those who are sponsoring this afternoon's celebration. Robbie Stern, hello and thank you. And Tracy Lai, hello and thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you to everybody that makes our work possible. The pandemic has witnessed the death of a quarter of a million people in the United States, many of which could have been prevented uh, if the lives and safety of working people were prioritized over the economy. Many of these people were essential workers. Our focus today. The majority of essential workers are women, black, indigenous, and people of color. As a renewed movement for black lives reminds us, state violence is an ever present reality for people of color in the United States as well. Please join me in a moment of silence, recognizing Russell, Jack, and the many, many others who have died from the pandemic or at the hands of state violence in, since we last met. Again, condolences. I now have the pleasure of inter introducing Casey, Con sorry, Connor Casey, uh, the head of the uh, Labor Archives of Washington, who will introduce you to the remainder of today's program. Thank you. Hi everyone, I think Connor's um, oh, no. video froze <laughs> up and we lost him. Right. Um, he has prepared his own script. So I'm not prepared to jump in here. Give me just one second. Um, well, I will say while uh, Connor is managing his tech logistics, um, this is our sixth annual event. Um, and the Labor Archives has just completed our 10th year in existence. And it's really exciting that we're still managing to um, have this event with everyone today. Normally we're gathering in person, um, but to be able to do it in a, a virtual environment so we can all um, be together. Really excited to hear from our panelists. It looks like Connor just popped back on, so I'm going to pass it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Sorry, everybody. My Zoom uh, dropped out immediately. Hopefully you can hear from me. Um, I'm Connor Casey, head of the Labor Archives of Washington. Um, I'm also the founding archivist of law. I've been directing law for 10 years. Um, this event is a celebration of 10th anniversary, and it is the Labor Archives sixth annual event. The purpose of law's annual events are to invite external communities to campus, and in this case, to a, sh a shared online space. Um, we usually partner with a community of stakeholders like our labor community donors or a community of scholars as part of the event, and you will see that in this, this year's event is no exception. Uh, we also promote existing projects of collections in the Labor Archives of Washington, and um, we acknowledge the gaps in our collections and ask the community to help us address some of those. Um, I think this event is particularly critical in thinking about how necessary it is to collect and preserve working people's history, and to think about how selecting, appraising, and processing those collections is an act of power, advocacy, and investment. We often um, acknowledge that history is written by the victors, but with archives and records relating to working people, even those histories cannot be written without the preservation of our history and our records. Um, as part of this program, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that uh, we are on the ceded and unceded lands 
uh, that we all stand on. Uh, the Labor Archives is part of the University of Washington, and we acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. They were the first people to transform this landscape with their labor, but too often are not considered in labor history. And so we want to acknowledge that we're, their, their presence in continuing labor today. Uh, the scope and content of this year's annual event really focuses on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on working people. Uh, first, we'll have a panel of worker leaders with members on the front lines from healthcare, agriculture, food packing, hospitality, grocery, and retail industries. And thanks very much to our panelists for your time and stories. Another panel will highlight several related oral history projects documenting workers in the pandemic done directly by or in partnership with the Labor Archives. This is an attempt at responsive collecting and documenting the now. Um, I think it's a great example of the ongoing history of the Labor Archives with partnering with faculty, students, and the labor community on oral history and digital collecting projects and programs over the years. Um, and thank you all, all to the, my co-presenters on that panel. Thank yous are also due to the members of this year's Labor Archives Annual Event Planning Committee. We do this event in partnership with the Bridges Center and the labor community. Thank you all for your time and thoughtful contributions to this event. Um, thanks to Andrew Hedden of the Bridges Center for running the tech for this event. He and Yasmin Ahmed uh, developed the template we are using for this event at the Bridges Center's annual award celebration last month, and that's why it's going to go very smoothly. <laughs> uh, the Labor Archives wouldn't exist without the community of donors and supporters who have supported us and sustained us over the past decade. Thank you for entrusting us with your collections, supporting us with your funding, advising us on our efforts and partnering on projects, using our collections, and just generally being in solidarity and community with us. Our friends of the Labor Archives organization are also critical supporters. To join, there's information at the end of our electronic program for this event. The past six months has seen a significant and power, powerful civil rights moment and reckoning. The Labor Archives and its staff are aware and have been deeply involved in conversations about how we can commit our words and actions to better serving BIPOC communities disproportionately harmed by police violence and structural racism. We felt that this topic was so important that rather than add it into our existing collecting, uh, our existing plans for this event, it should be its own event. And I just wanted to let everybody know that it will be our theme for next year's Labor Archives event. Um, we didn't want to just kind of graft it onto an existing program. With that, I will welcome our next speaker, who is Terry Mass, Secretary Treasurer of the Inland Boatmen's Union of the Pacific, a Law Advisory Committee member, a member of the Friends of the Labor Archives, as well as a member of this year's Planning Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Connor said, I, I am Terry Mass, the National Secretary Treasurer of the Inland Boatman's Union, and also serve on the Archives Committee. And I think our collection is maybe one of the first. Um, about over 30 years ago, ILWU Local 37, we were moving out of our building, a building that we had been in for over 50 years. And in that process of you know, trying to go through all the files, of course, we found a lot of things that we thought were treasures and we, we really didn't know what to throw out, what do we keep, what's a value, how do, we, how do we monitor and keep track of our history. So what we did was we called the UW Library Archives and uh, they came out, they packed it up, they filed it and they put everything in, in good order and we couldn't have been more appreciative of the work that they did to preserve our locals history and have it in a safe place where it could be accessed by scholars, students and community. And in fact, we are so proud uh, you know, to learn that those very files have been some of the most used at the, uh, at the libraries. So, um, we are, um, you know, we were excited to have our files there and I just want to put a plug in for everyone. As I know a lot of unions have moved these last few years and to make sure that you donate uh, your records to the archives. Because it is the only way to really preserve workers history. Um, I too then was really excited when we put together the labor archives as part of the Harry Bridges Center. Uh, one of it, one of only its kind uh, in the nation. Workers' history is not often told, as Connor said, and especially from our own perspective. And that's why every year we hold this annual event so that we can tell our stories 
And usually we just oppose um, a similar event in history to something that is a current event. But again, this year is unique. We're living through something that none of us have ever experienced and didn't have you know, a history really of other workers going through something like this. So we felt that it was really important to document our experiences of going through this pandemic. It has exposed workers, essential workers, and, and how workers keep our economy and our society moving. In some ways, I think, you know, some workers have become valuable in a way that I think people never thought that they were. But I, we can't have everyone on the panel today um, because there are many essential workers. So I just wanted to really also acknowledge how important transportation workers, maritime workers, and longshore workers are. Because without some of these workers, like most of you on the panelists, they wouldn't, you know, goods and services would not be moving without them. We too experienced some of the same things that you all did in the beginning, the lack of PPE for our members, uh, working in unsafe conditions, bargaining with our employers, struggling with them to keep up conditions for our members, urging them to step up, and our members working with the public in a day-to-day, -day being their very health being put in jeopardy. We have faced layoffs, reduced work, and in some cases, no work at all. For instance, the cruise industry that completely shut down. And also for our members who do ferry service to Canada, when the borders shut down, that ferry service also has completely shut down. Workers are hurting under the stress of everyday exposure to the pandemic. We are deemed essential in many cases, but not paid as essential workers. Our unions too are hurting. We are too being impacted by the lack of income during this pandemic. And for many workers who don't have unions, even are facing worse conditions. So today we, I'm excited to hear the stories from all of you that are going to be panelists and are willing to share with us your, your, um, your experiences during this pandemic. We want to hear your stories, document your history, and thank you especially for being part and being willing to be a part of the panel. So I'm going to pass back to Crystal and uh, proceed with the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, this is a perfect segue into our next segment, which features a panel of essential workers and union officers from a variety of industries. The panel discussion will be moderated by Carrie Freshour, faculty member at the University of Washington's Department of Geography. Um, following the 30-minute panel discussion, I will moderate a Q&A with panelists using questions submitted by you, the audience. Um, so I wanted to encourage you throughout this panel discussion to submit questions via the Q&A box down and the, at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I will compile the questions as they come in and ask as many as we have time for um, once we get to that uh, part of the segment. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Carrie to introduce the panelists and get this awesome discussion started. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to, to moderate this panel. I'm very grateful and honored. Um, so as Terry brought to our attention, right, many of us are thinking about the role of essential work and essential workers in our society and in the world. Um, as probably many of you have noticed or, or read in the news, right, there have been some really, really ugly realities of of COVID-19 surfacing the kinds of inequalities that essential workers are facing. Um, we see higher rates of COVID-19 and premature death for many of these workers. Um, and even the stories of, you know, Tyson chicken having a betting pool on, on the contraction rate of COVID-19 within their workforce. Um, so I think it's really, really important to have this space um, with these workers, fo folks who are at the, on the front lines and, and leading the struggle to actually build a working class movement in light of, of all that's happening in our world. Um, so our panelists today are, um, we have Katie Bray, who is a nurse at Harborview. Um, she comes with 13 years of experience and working in trauma surgical intensive care unit and the COVID-19 intensive care unit. 
Um, she is also an ECMO specialist and a union delegate for SEIU Local 1199. Our second panelist is Tom Geiger, who is the Special Projects Director of, of United Food and Commercial Workers UFCW Local 21, and he'll be sharing a collection of stories from workers across um, the different industries that UFCW represents for us today. Our third panelist is Violetta Oliveras. Um, she is the Secretary uh, for Trabajadores Unidos por la Justicia, and um, she will be accompanied by Edgar Franks, who will be helping with translation today. We're having a little bit of issues with their text, so I hope we can get them in. Um, <clears throat> Edgar is the political director for Familias Unidas, Unidas por la Justicia, and um, they're doing some really, really important work with agricultural workers in um, Eastern Washington and beyond. And finally, we have Cindy Richardson, who is a lead organizer and vice president of, of Washington State's Unite Here Local 8. Um, so the format for this section of, of our uh, panel today, I'll just ask a question and we'll give space for the panelists to, to answer in turn. Um, so our first question for today is, is just to get at um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you or members of your of your industries um, that your unions represent are really facing today with COVID-19? Um, hi, Carrie. Thank you so much. Um, like she said, my name's Katie. Um, I'm primarily a nurse, but I also fill, fulfill the role as a union delegate. Um, there's been a lot of challenges. I could go on forever about this, but I think initially there was so much unknown about the virus. You know, what's the best way to treat it? What's the best way to protect ourselves, um, our patients? Um, and as I think a lot of people have seen in the media, having access to personal protective equipment, you know, I don't think any worker has ever said, I don't wanna do the work, but I want the support and the supplies I need to do that work safely. Um, you know, it, almost feels like being a firefighter and having to fight a fire with a garden hose um, without you know, proper equipment that you know you need. Um, and then not only are there concerns about continued treatment for our COVID patients, um, Harborview where I work, we typically run at around 100% capacity most of the time and we still have to take care of those patients as well. Um, our policy now is if someone can't report or they can't talk because maybe they have a breathing tube in, we have to assume that they have COVID until we can test them. So these are patients that are getting CPR and need to go to surgery that we're doing this trying to be protected. Um, and I will say there's been definitely different levels of protection across the country. I've had a lot of coworkers that have taken travel assignments to um, work in harder hit areas. Um, I had a coworker that was in Chicago and for their PPE, they gave her literally a rain poncho. Um, you know, people that don't even have that in New York, you heard about garbage bags. And this is something that um, we've been facing every day. Uh, and then uh, I think there's been a lot of effects um, on people's personal lives as well. Um, another coworker that um, early on, she got um, evicted from her apartment because her landlord found out she was taking care of COVID patients um, and was fearful of getting COVID um, themselves. And so she had to sleep in her truck until she could find alternative housing. Um, you know, with all this equipment, um, like Carrie was saying, I'm an ECMO specialist. This is a machine um, that does two different modes, heart, lung bypass, or just lung bypass, which is one of the most intense therapies we have for our COVID patients. When I'm in that role, um, I don't leave the bedside for 12 hours, except for when I have um, someone to give me break coverage, which has been hard because we have been so short staffed. Um, you know, I've had coworkers that have gotten UTIs and even for myself, it's this fine balance of, I know I need to hydrate before I go into a room, but I don't wanna to hydrate too much because I don't wanna to have to go to the bathroom too much. Um, and is there gonna be someone that can safely um, 
help me take off my personal protective equipment when I'm coming out of the room. Um, and these continue to be ongoing issues. And even as a healthcare worker, early on we had, I didn't think this would be going on as long as it has. And um, what's turned into what we thought was maybe a marathon is turning into an ultra marathon. Um, but that's just kind of some of the challenges um, being a, a nurse in the hospital right now. So again, I'm Tom Geiger uh, with UFCW 21. We represent about uh, nearly 50,000 uh, workers across the state of Washington in healthcare, uh, grocery stores, uh, retail, uh, food processing, laundries, many, many different industries. So I thought that I would cover these challenges in a really a, a, a broad uh, sense um, because they are different in, in different industries, but uh, categorically, all these problems exist across all the industries. So, you know, I think the first and foremost, like Katie hinted at there was the issue of safety. Um, all across the board, people feeling like uh, their safety and the safety of either the patients or the customers uh, that they are uh, serving every day is, uh, is threatened. Um, and just the idea of having to wake up every morning and go to work and realizing that you were potentially engaging a deadly virus that is killing thousands of people a day is a, uh, or a thousand people a day is, is pretty uh, uh, wearing. And that's the second point is it just wears you out. Um, at the beginning, uh, how long was it going to last was a big question. Uh, now we're into our 10th month and there's really no end in sight, uh, depending on who you talk to, that end may be coming early next year um, or at least the beginning of the end. Um, so that's that emotional uh, wearing out is, is a second big challenge. A third challenge is just a, a feeling of deep uh, disrespect uh, from these employers, uh, many of whom, especially in the grocery store industry, uh, national grocery store change, uh, chains that are pocketing huge increased uh, profits and sales, um, yet are treating, um, as, as many workers there say, they, they've gone from being called a hero to being treated like a zero. That's, that's an expression I hear often across the industry. Um, last two points I would, would raise is um, the inequities that already existed across our culture and economy um, have really been exacerbated and the rawness of them have been exposed in this. And, and two points of that inequity in particular I would raise is um, racial inequity uh, in our culture um, and the deep racism uh, toward many members of the BIPOC uh, community. Um, we had quite a few, uh, in addition to the obvious uh, racism towards African-American uh, workers in our society, we had many Asian uh, members, uh, especially as President Trump was promoting, uh, as he would describe it, I won't even repeat any of his words, but uh, many Asian members getting uh, verbally abused in, in the workplace. Um, and then obviously the, the uh, uh, income inequities uh, are are severe. We've seen massive increases in CEO uh, pay. Uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon being the most extreme in the planet's history. Um, yet we haven't seen any real increases in worker pay, as they the one are the ones who are are bearing the the brunt of the the safety concerns. And then lastly, I would say there's challenging around organizing, uh, union organizing in a COVID. Uh, situation. In all these cases, uh, I think being part of the union, we've figured out, our members uh, have figured out ways to work together to help overcome these, and that's another part of the story that I hope we can get at today. Hi, my name is Cindy Richardson, and I'm the Vice President of Unite Here Local 8, and we represent 7,000 hospitality workers in airports and stadiums in hotels uh, in large cafeterias and we are definitely i believe the hardest hit of all industries 70 percent of our membership is laid off at this point um, and the challenges that we've been facing is with a very broken unemployment system where uh, the majority of our workers are low-waged workers and immigrants and people of color. It's been challenging to maneuver and understand uh, unemployment. 
everything is in English and many of our members, their second, third, fourth language is um, English and aren't able to answer the simple questions that are being asked of them. They also receive letters that make no sense and they have been in adjudication and uh, some of them have waited up to 30 weeks to receive benefits. Um, they also are only receiving um, around some of the low wage workers, 200 to $300 a week, which is not sustainable to try to make their bills. Um, this is what our industry is facing at this time. Um, I can also say that another one of the challenges is when workers are asked to go back to work with virtual learning and uh, schools being closed and uh, no daycare in sight. Um, they have to make a decision whether or not to go back to their job or to try or to stay home and lose their job and to continue to be on unemployment. Um, also, they're facing um, closures. We don't know if hotels, if or when they will open up. A lot of uncertainty and recall rights in a lot of areas have not been extended. So we don't know if they'll even be able to go back to work. And most of our workers were cut off of their employee um, or uh, negotiated health care. So during a crisis, a lot of our workers are now without health insurance also. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, thanks everyone for sharing those responses. And we're hearing a few, I think I, I'm hearing a few things that connect across what you've shared. Um, Tom really spoke directly to this um, when he mentioned the kinds of emotional strain, um, the being disrespected not only by employers, but also by customers in some of these places. Um, and then I'm thinking especially for, um, for Katie, this heavy sense of fatigue, as, as you mentioned, it's become a ultra marathon, right? When something that we didn't, we had no clue or expectation of the length of time this would last. So um, could you maybe share a little bit or speak to the difficulties of this sense of fatigue and then how this might have shaped daily working life for you and workers in your communities? Yeah, thank you. Um, I know you, we see it in the headlines all the time. Um, workers are fatigued, tired, um, and there are shortages. A lot of us are picking up extra shifts um, just to fill in the holes and it's still not enough. We're still running really short. Um, if you look at some of the CDC data on healthcare workers that have tested positive, um, some of the statistics um, and there are definition of healthcare workers as any worker um, that may be exposed to infectious material. That age group is actually 16 to 44 um, and 79% are female. So if you think about that, um, you know, these are people that probably have families, are our parents, and not only are health, you know, healthcare workers trying to treat patients, um, they are, they also have their own families, um, have a huge role um, in their family. Uh, so there's multi-stress, not just at work, but um, at home as well. Um, and I think personally for me too, um, there's a sense of guilt, even though my job's not easy, I'm so grateful I have a job and that, um, you know, I have a source of income. Um, and so even kind of reckoning um, with that fact. Uh, and, you know, I think also as a healthcare worker, we're unfortunately used to dealing with death and, and helping families through that. But the way we have to with COVID um, is so different now, um, where maybe that last goodbye, instead of being surrounded by all your family, all your loved ones is, you know, over a Zoom call. Um, and we also had to remember too, you know, thinking about the different demographics. Um, you know, we have had many patients that, you know, maybe based on their socioeconomic status, don't even have internet to be able to do that. 
don't have you know access to a laptop or phone um there have been different policy changes kind of throughout this pandemic on um whether someone can be at the bedside or not uh at end of life for our COVID patients but um the current policy is now um, we do allow two people to be at the bedside um they have to be supervised by um a staff member so we can ensure uh, they're protected, but the time limit is 20 minutes. And I can tell you there's nothing more heartbreaking. Um, you're in that room, you can't really give them privacy um, because we have to be there to make sure they're protected. And then we're the ones at the end having to say your 20 minutes are up, I'm so sorry. Um, and that's just having to do that day after day. Um, and then, you know, reading the paper and people think this is fake. Um, it's been so emotionally taxing. So, um, yeah, I would just add um, a few points uh, to, to Katie's excellent run through there um, and, and use some of our members' stories. So um, I think workers, as, as Connor uh, said in the, in the setup, workers telling the story is really what the story around this uh, pandemic is going to be. Um, not how CEOs weathered the storm or how the stock market um, increased in value, but about how um, essential workers kept uh, this country and, and other countries all around the world going. Um, so I would just say, a, a, use a, a couple of members uh, tell their stories here. Um, Cindy Frank is a nurse nope. at, uh, oh, I can back out. Is Edgar back? Yeah, great. You'll be able to share some of the challenges your workforce is, is facing right now with COVID-19. The challenges we've been facing, uh, well, especially at work, uh, it's been a little harder because uh, of the social distancing. Um, it's a little more, um, I'm going to say a little more stressful because um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, I can't even. Oh, I can. Okay, now it's been, a little, it's been a little bit of a challenge at work uh, due to the social distancing. Um, before we had a better, uh, I feel like more communication with each other, and the day went by uh, faster. Today, now at, at these, um, at this pandemic, we've been uh, forced to stay the six feet uh, distance, and sometimes it's just depressing. Um, it's not just taking a toll on, on our health, but our emotional uh, stability because at times we go to work and we don't know if we're going to get sick and come home and, you know, uh, put our family at risk. Um, or if we're going to, I already got sick from COVID and it was the worst feeling ever for me. Uh, and nothing like the colds I ever had. And, um, and I think my, my worst fear was uh, getting my family uh, um, um, sick as well. And thankfully that didn't happen. And um, I think uh, for all of us uh, that I can speak for all my coworkers, our worst fear is being out of work for two weeks because people fall, fall behind on their bills, their rent, everything, you know, economically, everything just takes a toll on you. And I think that's one of, I, I believe it's sad to say, but it's one of the things that uh, really gets to people the most because um, some of these are single mothers and it's just them for their kids and it, it's, it's hard. I mean, it hasn't been hard on me because thankfully my kids are adults already. So it's just me. But I know a lot of my coworkers are single mothers and it's taking a toll on, on their entire family because of this. So yes, it's, it's, we're just so ready for this pandemic to be over things to go back to normal you know it's just it's hard thank you, thank you. um i think i think for time i'm going to ask i think the question that's on many people's minds in the audience given the q a um so we're the the beauty of this panel is that you all are workers or organizers or both and so what has been, we'd love to hear um, what has been the role of unions throughout all of this? And um, where do you place the hope in, in the kinds of organizing that y'all are doing? Um, 
maybe we uh, could the, you mean uh, does our union come in and all this or um with covid uh it's been harder for us to to get to people because of course we don't have that um same opportunity to have them in all in one room you know we have to talk to sparingly to people uh, you know just throughout the day uh, before people were, were able to uh, have a meeting and have a uh, hundred people there now these days it's like just a couple you know not not even 20 people at the same room and it's been a little more of a challenge uh, trying to get spread the information out uh, so Yes, uh, this pandemic has not helped us with our, our uh, union organizing. It's, it's been a little more of a rough road. Yeah, I would just add a few points. I mean, I think one thing that ma has made it s marginally easier in a place like Washington is we went into the pandemic with certain elements in our uh, society that, that lend themselves to being more resilient. Uh, so when you look at having paid sick days as a law, uh, having a higher minimum wage in the law, although there are certain exemptions uh, to our minimum wage laws, which are not good uh, for workers, um, having paid family leave, those are things that just make us more able to weather the storm going in. Um, certainly, uh, the Trump administration has making uh, made organizing harder as well. Uh, so you combine the two, I think that makes it uh, hard. Uh, at UFCW 21, we've actually had significant success organizing healthcare units uh, and in, uh, in our grocery stores as well, signing up members. And I think across the board, the way that we saw uh, success there and, and on the hope side of things, it's really about worker-led efforts in the workplace. So in almost all cases, our union staff uh, have essentially not been able to go out and safely uh, go into the workplaces. So that those conversations have happened over the phone, uh, texting, instant messaging, social media, but the workers are in the workplaces and having the workers each communicating with each other is really our salvation. Yes, it has been hard for us because uh, you touched a good point there when you said about getting paid when you get sick. Uh, did you know that the program that pays you takes up to 12 weeks to pay you? I mean, imagine, three months with no benefits whatsoever. People are so afraid of getting sick. Some of them don't even say they're sick. They just go through the symptoms and come back to work uh, without even going to the doctor or, or doing anything that they just, you know, say I have a cold and then they come back to work and of course expose other people for the fear of not having an income come into their home. And it, that's, that's very sad. I mean, that shouldn't be take 12 weeks, you know, to get um, some type of income when you need it right away. It's, it's supposed to be something that ben, that helps you out uh, right away, not three months. So people kind of fear to, that's the biggest fear of them of getting sick because falling back financially is so hard. I had a, a coworker that lost her mother and two brothers to COVID uh, in a period of two months. And that was really hard for her, uh, not just emotionally, but financially as well. It's been two months that they passed away and she's still trying to get, you know, back on it because it's been, she was off from work a whole month, uh, dealing with her being sick and then dealing with her emotional uh, uh, stage uh, during uh, her mother's um, um, death and the brother having to uh, um, funeral arrangements, uh, everything that they have to take care of, you know, their homes, uh, these people have had a home, they have to take care of all of that. And it's, it's just so hard, like still right now, you see her and she's not doing well. She's just not doing well. I visit her as often as I can and she's still not able to uh, get out of debt. She owes like $30,000 still. And she's the one that stayed to pay that because she has no other way of any type of help. So yes, it's been very hard. Um, I'd like to just say, how do we come together as a union? Well, we got really busy in our union. Our leaders and community partners have had a um, helpline since April and six days a week. 
um, all of our volunteers and reaching out to our membership, helping with unemployment questions, helping with resources. And let me tell you, workers are so hungry just to hear from anyone during this time of despair because their companies are not reaching out to them. They really don't give a crap, right? And so it's been the union that's been there for these workers. And then the other thing that our union did is we never had it stop us from our political agenda to dump Trump. And we sent 1,700 um, canvassers to Arizona, Nevada, Florida, and Pennsylvania to defeat Trump. Uh, 30 of them came from our local and we were able to defeat him in the battleground states, um, which makes us very proud. Even though we were the hardest hit, we're gonna continue to fight. We're gonna continue to move forward. We're gonna continue to figure out how to organize and demonstrate either in the street, on Zoom, any way that we can so that we can continue to grow our union and to grow hospitality uh, in the state of Washington and everywhere. And it's really, showing the tenacity and the toughness of our members to continue to fight and move forward. Yes. Yes, I wish I wish uh, uh, we already had uh, our union going going by. I wish it was already established at work uh, so we can uh, try to help our coworkers more. Uh, there's so much that we need to do and change. Uh, like you said, uh, people are so hungry for your employer to reach out to you and say, you know what, this is what we can do for you. You know what, you have this type of help coming to you. Uh, like my coworker said yesterday when I went to take her something that uh, Familias Unidas gave me to give to her, she said, if this pandemic didn't kill me, uh, just the feeling of over overwhelmness is going to because I don't see the the light on, uh, you know, through this tunnel. I'm going through a tunnel, but I just don't see the light. You know, it's like, it's, there's so much, uh, people focus on the pandemic, but honestly, obstacles uh, at work are so many. Uh, the pandemic is not even one of them. It's uh, at work, you have stress, you have um, work-related injuries that sometimes you don't report because of course you're not gonna get the medical attention that you know you are uh, able to, that you should, that you deserve. They give you the runarounds. And uh, again, they're without, a, without work, uh, getting paid the minimum. And so some of these people don't report any of their job injuries because they're, um, they're afraid to lose their hours and their, the, the income that they get, because that's what they live on, you know, paycheck to paycheck. So yes, I, I, I wish, uh, that we had more to offer to the employees, you know, more uh, resources, more help in all ways, because uh, I, I believe that's one thing that we need to change um, throughout this. dated COVID-19 and are just getting worse with the pandemic. Um, I think we're going to move on to the Q&A section that um, Crystal will be moderating because there are a lot of good questions from the audience for y'all. Yeah, thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks to all the, the panelists um, and everyone who submitted questions in here. I won't be able to get to everything, but I'm trying to consolidate some related questions as much as I can. And one of the uh, most common questions that have been asked um, in the past half hour have been how we can best support you, support essential workers um, as customers, as grocery stores, um, as legislators, as fellow union members and organizers, mutual aid services. Is there a way to make direct contributions to these communities? So if each of the panelists could speak a little bit to um, these different ways that uh, the community can better support you. And, uh, Whoever wants to, to jump in there. 
Um, Tom, would you like to speak to how customers can better support um, grocery store workers? Um, sure, real quick. I mean, they're, the best thing that customers can do is practice uh, safe uh, practices. Uh, so wear a mask, um, limit the number of people in a store, um, practice social distancing, and then just show some deep uh, respect and value uh, for the workers when you see them every day. Beyond that, you can go to our website, ufcw21.org. We have various ways there that uh, people can either uh, support people financially, um, but also um, put pressure on the employers to reverse this obscene uh, disrespect uh, that uh, these CEOs have been showing uh, workers. And that goes in, into healthcare as well. We've seen outbreaks at, at several hospitals where our members work, and I'm sure across the board uh, with others, and put pressure on these companies to be more accountable, be more transparent. Um, the state of Washington also has safety uh, reports on their website. Uh, if we have enough people report those safety problems, uh, they actually go out and inspect these situations, and you know, ultimately, we can shut down a place if they're, if they're doing something wrong. So that's just a real quick overview. Thanks, Tom. Cindy, how about you with um, hospitality workers? Um, there's a couple ways. You can go to uniteherelocal8.org and you can um, donate to our hardship fund. Also, um, you can order food directly from the restaurants and then tip like hell if you have the uh, means to be able to do so. And then the last thing is when the restaurants and bars do open wear your mask and when the server comes to your table wear your mask put your mask back on when you're talking to the server because again you wearing a mask protects the other person so a lot of times you know you forget and you're eating and when the server comes to you you don't put your mask back on uh, in hotels tip your housekeepers wear your mask ask for daily cleanings um, those are the ways that in which you can help hospitality workers. Thanks, Cindy. Katie, would you like to speak to how we can help healthcare workers? Yeah, um, I think first of all, I can't imagine um, having a loved one come to the hospital and we're telling you, you know, you can't come or only one person can come. Um, but I think to everybody, just to try to be kind and patient. And I know that's really, really hard. Um, and I think the other thing I would say um, is when we use our collective vote, um, I pay really close attention our which candidates are pro labor candidates that are gonna support workers um, from many different job sections. Because in the end, I think some of the biggest protections from workers have been based in Washington state law. Like we have a law for um, mandatory breaks um, you know, for healthcare workers, which you think it shouldn't have to come to that to have a law. And sometimes our employers don't even follow the law, but I think that's a really important step um, is to vote in candidates that you know are gonna back laws or legislation that the focus is um, not on big businesses, companies, but um, that are really gonna prioritize uh, protections for healthcare workers and not just healthcare workers, um, just the whole labor force in general. Um, I think that makes a huge difference. Thanks, Katie. Um, how about uh, Edgar and Violetta? Would you like to speak to how the community can best support farm workers? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I think um, one of the biggest things that we're looking for, um, and it's some kind of a new territory for us, at least for Familias Unidas, is um, help through the legislature uh, to fight some of the big historic things that farm workers have been advocating for years, whether it be banning pesticides. Um, you know, we are seeing what's happening with the Supreme Court um, over workers having access at workplaces, um, which uh, if the Supreme Court overturns uh, that ruling um, about access to workplaces, um, I could have a big, uh, uh, negative impact on farm worker organizing. So those are some of the big things, uh, at least legislature wise that we're 
kind of looking at. Um, and right now, I think focusing on Trabajadores Unidos por la Justicia in Yakima, um, just showing solidarity to this new union that's formed under um, uh, under the COVID era. Um, and hopefully by the end of this month, there'll be a vote for the union, um, even though there's anti, there's union busters and consultants at the company, but yet the workers are already voting and hopefully they'll come out on top. So if people want to send like pictures or videos of their members saying support Trabajadores Unidas or support uh, uh, TUJ, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, that's solidarity. I'm sorry, can I just add one one more thing? Um, also, um, follow us on Facebook. Uh, there should be some upcoming actions um, and tell the, the federal government and the state government don't leave workers out of extending uh, unemployment rights. Um, most of our workers will fall off of unemployment in mid-February if there's not an extension of unemployment. As work does not come back in our industry, this will cause homelessness and it, it just is mind-boggling that um, they're going to continue to bail out businesses but leave workers in the dust. And so um, please follow us uh, on Facebook to continue to uh, look for actions coming up. Sorry. <laughs> to, oh, I guess I was muted. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, we have time for one more question. So I'm just looking through the list to try to bring some things together. Um, do you see, do any of you see some successes, um, you know, putting in place better protections and um, improving working conditions for workers as a result of the pandemic that will make things better for folks um, long after the pandemic is over, if anybody wants to speak to that. Um, this is Edgar. I think one of the important things that we've, um, we're really striving for is to leave a legacy and a culture of organizing um, all over uh, farm worker country and wherever there are low wage workers and immigrant workers and uh, undocumented workers, um, especially in the heart of agriculture in Eastern Washington and rural Washington. Um, we wanna establish and leave a legacy of, of, that, of, of organizing and unionizing. Um, I think that can go a long way um, especially in shifting the political consciousness of, of immigrants and people that have been marginalized um, um, throughout, you know, for, for many generations. So having a culture like that where unions and organizing, um, uh, leaving that legacy um, really can go a long way, uh, especially when workers go out on strike and ask for their rights demand the rights. Thanks, Edgar. Would anybody else like to speak to that? Tom? I could add, yeah, just uh, really appreciate Edgar, all, all your work and uh, our members have come out there several times and we'll continue to march with you. Um, you know, I think that the one, one additional thing that I would make is the thing that we have all known forever, right, which is that these essential workers are the ones that make the thing work, right? They're the thing that uh, takes care of people, produce food, uh, educate our kids, uh, keep our streets uh, clean, uh, collect our trash, do everything to make our society work. And I think that the, the, the level of acknowledgement for the importance of essential work has been elevated uh, as a result of the pandemic. So that's one thing. And then the, the interconnectedness of all that work and all people, uh, honestly, um, and whether it's a food system, a healthcare system, whatever, has also been clarified. And hopefully uh, we kind of keep that in, in our mind as we move forward, because we really are all connected. Katie? Yeah, this, this is Katie. 
I, yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, if you look at union membership trends over the last couple of decades, membership is down. There's been a lot of um, bad legislation, like right to work states to really, um, you know, stop some of that union activity. But I think this has really shown um, the importance um, that unions have. And I think hopefully we'll reinvigorate um, membership. And um, there's been some issues that um, are not new like systemic racism in the workplace, um, sh uh, staffing shortages for hospitals. These are not new things since COVID, but hopefully this is putting a little bit more pressure to try to fix some of these things as well. Thank you so much. All right, we are at time for this segment. I wish, I feel like we could probably fill an entire day with conversation about this. Um, so, so grateful to everyone for being here. Um, and thanks to Carrie for moderating and thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Um, and this exciting conversation only further reinforces how critical the labor of essential workers are now and always and how labor organizing plays an essential role in demanding that basic rights and protections are secured for all workers. So now we're gonna to pivot to hear from several individuals engaged in projects that seek to capture and preserve the firsthand perspectives of essential workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd also like to acknowledge that these oral history projects are supported in part by the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. And I just want to um, say a huge, huge thank you. We, we couldn't do it without your, your support. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists for this next segment. Um, our first speaker is Wendy Zhou. And Wendy is an undergraduate student at the University of Washington, double majoring in history and philosophy. She directs the Seattle COVID-19 Oral History Project, which aims to document the lives of workers in Seattle and Western Washington impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and hopes to attend graduate school to potentially study histories related to memory and race. Our next panelist is Mark Rogers. Um, and Mark is a lecturer in music history at the School of Music, where he teaches a seminar for advanced music majors and graduate students called Musical Work, um, studying issues in contemporary aesthetics and musical labor. In spring 2020, students in this course collected oral history interviews with musicians and their professional networks as part of the musical work in the time of COVID-19 project. Our last panelist for this segment is Connor Casey, who you met previously. He is the head of the Labor Archives and curator of collections. Part of this curatorial work includes capturing and preserving the firsthand perspectives of workers and organizers through oral history interviews. And Connor will be speaking today about his involvement with the Working in the Time of COVID-19 Oral History Project and his collaborations with Wendy and Mark. So um, because Wendy is not able to be with us today in person, um, we're going to watch a video that she has graciously put together uh, detailing her work on the project. And then following Wendy's video, Mark and Connor will discuss their projects with us. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Andrew get the video uh, by Wendy started. Okay, we're gonna pivot to our conversation with, um, with Mark and Connor, and then hopefully spend the last five minutes watching Wendy's video. Um, no problem at all. Uh, thanks, Andrew. So um, Mark and Connor, can you each describe your oral history projects? Talk a little bit about who you interviewed, who did the interviewing? and why these stories are so important to capture and preserve. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Crystal. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so as Crystal said uh, just a moment ago, uh, musical work in the time of COVID-19 comes out of a course that I teach uh, really for adv advanced music majors and graduate students in the School of Music. Um, and I last offered this course in, in spring 2020, and it was pretty clear as I was preparing this course early on in the pandemic um, that musicians were going to be hit pretty hard. So I rewrote the syllabus at the last minute to focus on, on what was then a, still a developing situation, and I guess still today is a developing situation. Um, and I made oral history interviews, actually the capstone project for that 
for that class. So the students in this course are mostly performers and composers, mostly on pre-professional tracks. Um, and I asked them to interview musicians in their networks with a special focus on the Puget Sound region. We got a wide range in terms of the, uh, the, the, the folks that they interviewed. Uh, there's an Olympia-based songwriter who works as the lead guitarist on Glee, the TV show Glee. There's a member of the Seattle Symphony. There's a freelance jazz musician just kind of getting his feet wet um, in the Seattle scene. Many, many more stories. Um, the students themselves conducted these interviews. And if you watch the videos, if you get a chance to watch the videos, you'll see that they did a really great job, um, especially I think during the circumstances. Yeah, so that's a little bit of background for the, for the project. And uh, for our project, uh, working in the time of COVID-19, um, it's really kind of an example, as I alluded to earlier, of what we call in archives and um, history is documenting the now, which is trying to do uh, dynamic collection building um, with an eye towards inclusion, but also um, not recreating some of the biases that create omissions in the archival records. So uh, the idea was to try to um, look at a diverse cohort of people that were frontline workers first, directly with humans, um, to try to develop a group of questions that we would ask across all the interviews. And so um, that way, uh, maybe in the future, it would be more useful to researchers to be able to extrapolate different trends and compare things to one another. So we developed this core questions, but then we also, in partnership with unions like um, United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 21, SEIU 1199 um, Healthcare Workers, to figure out what questions we should be asking about those occupational groups or organizations them, from themselves, right? And to make sure that the questions that we are asking were both useful for academics and future historians, but also useful to the organizations themselves and representative of their experience. And um, that's really what we've been doing so far. Um, the other part that we've played a, a role in is helping support faculty and student research projects. So um, had the good fortune of um, talking to Mark early on in the project and making sure that if we were going to collect and preserve it from the labor archives angle, we we're able to uh, create permissions uh, process, um, kind of uh, figure out file naming conventions, recording formats, how we're going to create intellectual access to it. The same things that we were developing for our project, um, the same is true of Wendy's project. And I think this is an example of how um, these are both documentation or, but it's also an example of the kind of things that we've been doing in terms of partnering as consultants with faculty and um, students uh, over the years to try to make sure that we can help assist them in making sure that we uh, make things that are, are um, usable in terms of a permission or publication um, standpoint later, but also preservable um, and that we have access to them in the long term. And um, so that's kind of what, what the genesis of our part of it was, both co consultation and collection. Great, thank you so much. Um, you both already kind of spoke to this, but perhaps you could speak in a little bit more detail to the collaborative nature of these projects. I know that you, uh, Connor, Mark, and Wendy have all worked together. You have your separate projects, but they're all interconnected. And um, I'm sure also partnerships with labor organi organizations and the people that you're interviewing um, also helped shape the interviews themselves, if you both could speak to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I'll say that partnerships have been absolutely essential for the uh, for the success of this project from the get-go. Connor spoke about um, how early on we kind of looped the Labor Archives of Washington into the process, and that was extremely helpful. Uh, the Bridges Center also provided uh, some funding for transcriptions, um, and you know the Labor Archives uh, has provided logistical support as well as a permanent home for the for the collection. Um, so all of this assistance has just been essential for preserving what I think are some, some really interesting and quite important stories uh, for posterity. I should say it's also been huge for the, the students to participate in something like this, to see their work preserved in this fashion. It's a really big deal. It's, it's been encouraging to a lot of them um, just in terms of thinking about how this fits into their academic uh, trajectory and, and, their, and their future careers. Um, and I want to shout out, give a shout out especially to Jay Rausch, one of the graduate students in music composition. Um, who worked really hard over the summer to edit a lot of the, um, the transcriptions uh, from AI, AI software that had kind of uh, spit them out um, in, in not in a usable form, um, and then to finalize them for, for publication as well. So yeah, these partnerships have been absolutely essential uh, to, to, to getting this project off the ground. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things I've been really excited by is the way in which it's kind of cross pollinated. Um, you know, we have these core of questions that were derived. Actually, I should I should mention this: the core questions that we started out with themselves were actually based on some sort of questionnaire that was done by a historical society. Uh, one of our colleagues within Special Collections shared it and was going to do an online questionnaire. I thought, well, this would be good if we were able to add this to the core of questions and then add some to it, but indicate which ones were part of that questionnaire so that people would be able to see it as part of kind of a broader tapestry of a nationwide project. Um, then we derived the other ones that were more the those industry specific ones I was telling you about that we ask all the workers within specific occupations. Well, the cool thing was, you know, I got to talk to some folks from SEIU, um, Healthcare Workers 1199. You, uh, you may remember that Katie's a member. I also talked to the folks from the eboard. Um, to develop the questions. And then we got to talk with other people as part of Wendy's project, which then improved the questions all across the board. And then, you know, I talked to Mark about, oh, I think these core questions that we've derived for the beginning project might be something that the next round of students might be interested in integrating in it. So in a way, I feel like the more we ask, the better questions we get. And um, luckily we were able to do that sort of at the beginning. Um, I think that we're, we're figuring out what we should be asking people. And that's been really exciting. I think the collaborative funding model is really cool. We got um, funding to be able to pay for um, a just graduated, no longer student uh, professional position to help us with the workflow angle on our end because we knew that there was gonna be a lot of um, interviews coming in. Our initial goal was to get about 20 or 30 done because I wanted to not over promise. Um, I think we're gonna have no problem hitting that target. Um, and it's partly because of these great other projects that are happening. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how it evolved. And I think the cross-pollination of practice and process has been really interesting. And also, um, you know, just the way in which Wendy thought about her grant writing and, and um, some of the ways she articulated some things in, in her um, grant about paying people they're interviewing um, for their time. It's things that I would I think are really good models to do in the future. So I, I really was grateful of that. I think that um, I was very impressed by uh, Mark's uh, angle of making sure that it's a student project so that there's meaningful work. That's the earmark of, you know, um, uh, constructivist learning is that you're doing something that's meaningful and ha it has direct application to real life. So these are all just great ways of the kind of projects we want to be involved with. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, final question. I'm sure all of the folks attending are eager to know is how and when can we access these interviews? Oh, that's the exciting part. Okay, so we are uh, ultimately gonna serve these up through the Internet Archive. Um, they'll be streaming there. There will be um, different manifestations of it. One will be an AV file, either a video or an audio track. It will also have a captioning track to make them more accessible. Um, for people of different levels of ability and intellectually accessible. We're also generating a transcription and they'll all be served up through there. We will also preserve them long-term through the Labor Archives of Washington so people can get their hands on the original files. Um, so far, um, I've done only six because we've been doing a lot of legwork first um, of, of the group of, that we've done. Uh, Mark's group has already done 10. Um, we're now at the point where we've done most of the transcription for that batch, we've done title cards, which is like the, the introduction uh, text that you see at the beginning of videos to make sure people know where they came from. And now we're gonna be handling the metadata and putting them online. So um, we're entering the phase where we're really uh, kicking the tires on that workflow and making it so that we can delegate it for other people and we can make it um, shared so that if people wanna do similar projects, we can use this as a proof of concept to help share that with them. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a really exciting project and I'm so excited to have an opportunity to listen to these interviews. Um, now, I think we've got the audio working on Wendy's video. So we're gonna pivot back to hear a little bit from Wendy about um, her oral history project. Hello, I'm Wendy Zoe, an undergraduate student at the University of Washington, and I'm the project lead in charge of developing and managing the Seattle COVID-19 Oral History Project, collecting oral histories of workers that will be shared on multiple platforms, including with the Labor Archives working in the time of COVID-19 Oral History Project collections. In addition to the Labor Archives, this research project is conducted with the support of the UW Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. 
To give a bit of background, Smithsonian Magazine has documented the recent rise in oral history projects sponsored by institutions of higher education as a way to capture life during the pandemic. So these include Princeton University's COVID-19 and Me initiative and Tufts University's COVID-19 documentation project, which focuses mainly on students, faculty, and the general public associated with the college or a university and their experiences in the time of COVID. However, these projects tend to exclude the portion of the population who are less privileged, for example, those without college degrees. Other initiatives, such as the project, doc the project sponsored by the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women at Brown University, are not geared specifically toward workers whose daily lives have often been changed the most by the pandemic. Both Mark Rogers with Musical Work in the Time of COVID-19 and Connor Casey with the Working in the Time of COVID-19 Oral History Project have been working to fill these gaps along with my own project. We have sought this out through intentional collaboration and a community-based question development model. Collectively, our projects will cover interviews with impacted workers such as musicians, teachers, healthcare and transportation and transit workers, as well as grocery, retail and custodial workers. My project funded by the Bridget Center and a professional trainings a professional training opportunities program grant from the Northwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety hopes to collect oral histories from workers who have usually been impacted the most by the pandemic in terms of economic or occupational changes and health related regulations. It aims to explore how the lives of workers, especially those from racial minority groups in Seattle and Western Washington have been impacted by COVID-19 and the nuances of intersectionality related to identity and occupation during this period. Interviews will be conducted with the support of a team of around 10 paid student interns who will be hired near the end of fall and who will develop useful skills and a greater knowledge of local labor communities. The desired outcome for this project are threefold, one being the creation of an oral history archive accessible to students, researchers, and the general public. Another goal is to produce a report exploring the nuanced interactions between occupational status and race, ethnicity, and immigration in the global pandemic. And the final aim is to present the project and its research at the Undergraduate Research Symposium this year. While the foci in each of our own projects aims to highlight differing experiences, our synergistic approach seeks to create a model for a collaborative oral history projects, archives, students, faculty, and the labor community. My team and I will be interviewing workers and those who have been laid off associated with the local chapter of the Asian and Pacific American Labor Alliance, or APALA, Unite Here Local Aid and Service uh, Employees International Union, SEIU 1199NW. Through the course of the year, the Labor Archives will play a role in supporting the project and serving as a guide for the digital, archival, and community collaboration aspects of it. The Labor Archives has already insist, assisted in developing an oral history training toolkit for student interviewers, incorporating permission forms, guides for using technology and best practices, and has co-developed a collaborative question development process where stakeholders work to develop specific interview questions geared to the various communities, labor organizations, and occupations they represent. I am glad to have the support of the Labor Archives in the near future with regards to file management, the facilitation facilitation of transcribing interviews, preservation, and the creation of a platform for public and scholarly access through the UW Library's special collections. All right, well, big thanks to Wendy and big thanks to Mark and Connor. Um, I'm going to pivot us now to the final segment of our event today. Um, Connor and I will both uh, give you an overview on the Labor Archives of Washington um, programming, the evolution of the Labor Archives, um, and to what we have today over the past 10 years. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Connor to kick us off. Thank you, Crystal. And let's see, um, this is the part where the PowerPoint comes in that I believe uh, Andrew, our tech, tech master, will be starting. Well, um, as we wait for the PowerPoint to gear up, I just wanted to talk to you about a little bit about the labor archives. As we talked about before, 
Um, the Labor Archives really began as a collaboration uh, between the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies and the University of Washington Library Special Collections 10 years ago. Um, it began as a, um, a collabor collaboration um, in 2008, a fundraising campaign that gave rise to the start of the archives in 2010. The Labor Archives itself documents the world of work. Uh, the Labor Archives is where you can find the stories of working people who built this region and their own voices. Uh, we collect unique, one-of-a-kind treasures that are part of the public trust and open to research by all. And we're a place that welcomes a broad community of users into the libraries and the university from the faculty of the university students and community members, union officers and members and others. Um, and I think this is critical because without collection, as we've talked about, those stories can't be told in the future, can't be understood in the present. Um, without description and the work that Crystal's going to cover um, in terms of description access and preservation initiatives here, um, you know, really these collections remain silent. We'll be in boxes, but they'll be voiceless. And so it's essential that we also create intellectual access for this stuff and that we continue to promote it through exhibits and outreach and programs like this. Um, in a, a sense, what we're doing is we're giving the boxes a face and the people whose stories are contained within a name. Um, it allows researchers to learn from and retell these stories so that they can live on. Um, may I please see the next slide, Andrew? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna give you an overview here. Um, I don't intend to be comprehensive in this. What I want to do is kind of skim through, but as an archivist, I want to make sure I cite my sources. So I'm probably going to skip through a lot of slides, but rest assured that there'll be images of stuff that we've done over the years. Um, next, please. Thanks. Um, here's the thing about our mission, and I, I just like to highlight the fact that we are to preserve and make accessible the, the records of interconnected histories of civil rights and social justice organizing and labor history um, and to set, serve as a center of historical research. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, unions and organized labor play a critical role in the founding and support of the archives, but our scope is also the dimension of work so that it's broader and we have an intentionally intersectional approach to this. Uh, next, please. And reflecting back on uh, 10, 10 years, um, what we've really tried to do, you know, between 2010 and 2016, as we tried to secure ongoing funding, is try to build a program uh, from projects. So in other words, parlay some of these projects or short-term initiatives into ongoing programs. How do we also um, change these contexts into ongoing relationships with our community of donors and supporters and users. Um, really, we hope to create a relationship that was reciprocal with the communities that donated to us rather than just transactional as in when it crosses the line into in the archives, it is now complete. Um, and really to look at the long-term impacts rather than short-term games in terms of bringing these collections and collaborations. We sought sustainable sources of funding um, from the outset and ongoing um, and really to bring equity, diversity, and inclusion to the center of our outreach and curation activities. Um, I'll touch that on that in just a sec. Next, please. Um, here are some of the major uh, pro projects that we've completed over the last 10 years. That includes addressing the backlog that we were formed to uh, address. That was over 2,000 cubic feet or copy paper boxes of uh, unprocessed materials, brought in 350 plus collections, uh, we have hosted uh, over 330, 134 students, volunteers, and interns, um, made access advancements. We started to do our own annual event, of which this is one. Uh, we expanded to two full-time staff members, um, including myself and now Crystal. Thank God. <laughs> uh, and uh, we got state funding in 2015, which was renewed in 2017 and 2019. Um, another thing we've done is try to offer more direct services to our community. Um, external to the university. So that includes doing workshops, consultations, and a regional record survey, which really helps with our documentation to make sure that we're not missing any of the, um, the stories of the people that have not been in the archive before. Uh, we have new means of budgeting, tracking, and accountability for the processing of our collections as well. Um, these are all ways in which we're trying to think of things in a strategic planning um, uh, initiative kind of uh, thing, and to think of it as an ongoing program, as I alluded to, not just a one-off project. Next, please. So 
In terms of collecting, one of the things we engage in is called corrective collecting. Um, I noticed that one of the uh, columns here is missing, but essentially what you do is you look at the, uh, the records that you're the steward of, and if it doesn't look like the people that have lived in that region or the people that have worked over time, you've got big problems because they're not uh, addressed in your, uh, your um, collections, and thus they're not going to be told in history. And so one of the things we try to do is look at through scholarship, negative reference questions, as in uh, we aren't able to generate things that people are interested in, asking members of the community, what do we need to be collecting to make sure that we address these gaps in documentation? Our regional record survey is part of that, so is our outreach and some of our direct initiatives that I'm going to talk, cover in just a moment. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is this convoluted kind of factory workflow is an example of um, how you map uh, the community networks and what it might look like when you do this. In this case, the intersection between uh, feminist labor organizing, cannery worker organizing, civil rights and social justice labor organizing, and labor unions and other um, adjacent organizations um, in the uh, 30s through the 70s, but it's pretty much like the inside of your head when you're trying to figure out who do you talk to and what collections you should be bringing in. Next, please. Um, we're also, I just wanted to emphasize that we are continuing to work, though we've been uh, sheltering in place and working off-site since March. We brought in records over this past year that include um, important occupational communi communities, such as the ones that um, Terry is the leader of, um, as well as uh, environmental and labor organizing, uh, hospitality um, industry as represented by Unite Here, um, as well as tech worker organizing and other important initiatives, including the ILWU, which was central to our founding and continues to be a central supporter and stakeholder. Next, please. Um, access. So basically what we've been trying to do is to do transcriptions and uh, collection finding aids that are, are, in, that are bilingual as well as um, in English. We've been doing uh, translations and oral histories, and we've been doing digitizing of collections um, as well as bringing in born digital collections. Next, please. We also do things to help uh, go back to the community to ask how we just should describe things and to make them more accessible so that people can find them on uh, popularly used resources such as Wikipedia. So we're adding entries and adding links from existing entries so that people can actually find our finding aids. Next, please. This is kind of a whole, um, overview about the kind of things we do, but that includes the Edit-a-thon, our standalone annual event. We have traveling and on-site exhibits. Now uh, several of them are online as well. We do workshops, teaching, and offer for credit courses through the University of Washington. Um, we also have a radio show that I'll cover in just a sec, and we also often table and attend and present at conferences and events. Next, please. Here you'll see us. This is the strategy that uh, Crystal and I call you again, because <laughs> in that you keep showing up at the same events over and over again. And we get people sign up and uh, offer to donate collections. But the idea is that we are there at events and we're in community with people so that we're a, we're a known, known entity so that we're more likely to get collections. Next, please. Um, this is an example of the different collaborative oral history and digital scholarship projects that we talked about, of which working in the time of COVID-19 is one. We also had one called CTAC Seattle Minimum Wage History Project. Um, next, please. Uh, we partner with other organizations such as the Washington State Labor Council, which for years had a Mayworks Festival, um, Pacific Northwest Labor History Association. We've hosted a traveling exhibit of the Longshore Union, ILWU. Um, we partner on our annual events with uh, workers organizations, including farm workers for our first annual event. We um, often partner with external organizations such as the Carlos Bulasan exhibit, which we partnered with the Inland Boatman's Union on. Um, and then the next example, next please. Uh, was a really good example of the, how we could cross pollinate and create a broader framework. We did those whole helped uh, lead a, an initiative to try to coordinate statewide programming with a bunch of stakeholder organizations in 2018 to about 2019 um, for the Solidarity Centennial, which is the 100th anniversary of the Seattle General Strike, as well as the Centralia tragedy of 1919. Next, please. Uh, you know about our annual programs. This is just an example of the overview, but the idea is that they're collaborative they're aimed at external communities and that they're to promote collections as I covered before. Next, please. Um, we also have that exhibition program I was talking about. The important part is that the, we've continued to generate exhibits. Next, please. 
And we have a mobile exhibit program, one um, version of which is a collaboration on the Washington State Labor and Education Research Center. So we have collaborative exhibits that we put on with other organizations and they travel so that people can host them in their union halls or libraries or different um, community events. Next, please. Um, another thing we have is a radio show segment. We have 30 episodes so far and different things that relate to our collections to teach people how to use our collections and do research. And the real role of that is to showcase researchers who have used our collections and the people who are the experts in their own history who donated collections. And then we just talk about how to use the collections. Next, please. Um, Crystal is also the head of our social media program, which has grown by leaps and bounds. But the real idea here is that we make it programmatic, consistent, as I mentioned, equity, diversity, and inclusion centered, and that the co collections and events um, focused goes also to a regular programmatic posting thing so that people can actually find us. Next, please. Funding is another thing. We're now responsible solely for our fundraising as we'll cover in a moment. Uh, we've expanded uh, since we've become a, uh, responsible for our own fundraising campaign from contacting roughly 300 uh, organizations and people to around 2,500. Um, we also uh, invite people to join the Friends of the Labor Archives. Uh, we engage in grant funding. This last year, we uh, raised over $14,000 to try to support projects like the ones we've talked about. And then there's also a Seattle labor ride that has raised around $1,000 with us for us um, uh, during the past couple of years. Next, please. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to offer direct services to the labor community, to our, the educational community that uses our collections and to other stakeholders. Next, please. Um, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Michael McCann and George Lovell's uh, book that was published this year. And this is an example of the research that we um, have generated at his user collections over the years. Um, I think it's a great example of partnership and use of the collections. Next, please. And the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project website, a consortium of sites um, that have drawn from and really gave rise to the labor archives through its use. Next, please. Now, um, Crystal Rogers, will, who will discuss preservation and access and other initiatives. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the processing work that myself and our many students and volunteers have engaged in. Um, as the processing archivist for the labor archives, um, I oversee the preservation and description of labor history collections in our care to ensure that they're stored properly so that they last long into the future and are also described in such a way that the community can better understand and access these materials. And in the past year, approximately 14 collections have been rehoused and inventoried or further processed, including the records of Radical Women, Ridge, Casa Latina, the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union. And this is over 75 cubic feet of material or 81 records boxes of collections. And that doesn't even include the digital stuff that we're bringing in. And this took about uh, 3,840 hours of, sorry, I just banged on my door. Um, staff and volunteer time and approximately $15,000 worth of archival supplies and $3,445 of paid student work. Um, next slide, please. Of course, Connor and I don't do all this work alone. Throughout our existence, we continue to rely on and benefit from the labor and expertise of students, interns, and community volunteers, many of whom are also members of the labor community. Next slide. Over the past year, we have had two graduate students, four undergraduate service learning students, two interns, and three volunteers. Um, you can see on the right hand of this slide featuring uh, Diana Roca and Abby Maynard, two interns that have worked with the Labor Archives of Washington remotely to enhance access to our collections. Um, Diana, over the summer, worked to translate the entire finding aid for the Casa Latina records. And this is now our second bilingual finding aid at the Labor Archives and is really integral to the work that we do because we want to ensure that community members whose histories we are preserving um, can actually access the descriptive tools um, about these collections documenting their lives and work. And Abby Maynard, a recent information school graduate, just finished yesterday her archivist in residence with the Labor Archives funded through the Northwest Archivist. She has worked to enhance access to the records of uh, Ridge, a community organization formed in Roslyn, Washington in 1988 that engaged in environmental activism and did this work through coalitions with um, labor unions um, and they were active through 2014. Next slide. 
This is Ernie Dornfeld, one of our uh, longstanding volunteers at the Labor Archives. Um, and just wanted to say thanks to everyone that has helped us do the work that we do. We really couldn't do it without, without all of you. Next slide. Just wanted to put a plug for our Pacific Northwest Regional Records Survey. Um, you can see the link here that'll take you to the links to the online surveys. And this is collecting information about the records of labor unions and labor organizations both collected by repositories in the Pacific Northwest, as well as labor organizations and labor unions, enabling us to better offer our services to the labor community to ensure that these valuable records documenting the labor movement are preserved. Really grateful for everybody that's spent some time on a sunny, well, sunny in Seattle, uh, Saturday afternoon, and everybody take really good care of yourselves.